picked this trip up today from Churchill, Manitoba. Churchill, Manitoba is on the shores of Hudson Bay on the western side. It's a really interesting place, especially that you can only get here by airplane or train, no cars. So the first thing to do, of course, is get the airplane secured, and I did that with about every scrap I could find for tire chocks and tie downs, but once that was accomplished, so after getting the airplane secured, I was able to get a rent a truck and head into town. Of course, I had to head through town and check things out a little bit on the Cape and then circle back. And uh, it's like a frontier town, really cool. And uh, picked out this hotel, which I later became friends with the owner, who is the mayor of Churchill, a guy by the name of Mike Spence. So, checking in, really nice, quiet place. Got to my room, settled in, looking forward to a good night's sleep, and then I was noticing. <laughs> I've definitely, definitely had my polar bear experiences, but uh, yeah, you have to be careful in Churchill. Not all the time, not often, but, but attacks do happen. And uh, this is a image of a woman named Erin Green who the year after I was there that year was attacked and mauled and luckily her screams were heard and there was a man who was staying at the hotel who had a shotgun and was able to get the bear off of her and then back several years before in 2003 when I was there just to the a little ways to the northeast this man Kutu Shaw was attacked while he was sleeping in his tent. He was a guide and uh, with the group, and he was able to scramble part of the way out, but the bear had already uh, done much damage until somebody could finally get a gun loaded and get the bear off. Uh, he had a very tough time recovering. Oh, I woke up the next morning, had a great breakfast at the seaport. It was a clear, sunny day and wasted no time, got in the airplane, got on my first uh, first stop, which was this place called Sloop Cove. It was isolated on the western side of the Churchill River, but of course, with an airplane with tundra tires, bam, I could get in. So I took a nice, slow approach, lined way out, straight in, executed a pretty decent wheel landing and uh, had some room left at the end. So uh, circled back around, got it set up and I had about a quarter mile or so hike south to uh, get to this place called Sloop Cove and uh, the next thing you know I was looking at it. Today looking at it it's really just a very small pond if anything the receding shoreline from centuries ago. But back in the day, there were some sizable ships that would come in there and they tie off. And you can still see the actual iron rings that are still in the rock, staining the rock with the rust. It's kind of like a time machine. You can imagine just the ships. And then you start looking around and you see these carvings in the rocks. These are the actual inscriptions from the men, the sailors that were there. And one, one guy that was there was a real famous guy. His name was Samuel Hearn. He worked for the Hudson's Bay Company and he was a fur trader and an explorer. And here you can see his carving in the rock too, just as it was yesterday. It's like a time machine, perfectly preserved like so many of the others. So my next stop was going to be the Prince of Wales Fort, which was just up the river here at the mouth of the Churchill. And it was uh, interesting, it was built, it started as a log structure in the 1700s by a guy named James Knight. And actually, this next stop on my mission involved him and it was pretty eerie. It's called Marble Island and this place is supposed to be cursed. 
And boy, when I flew over it, I could get the feel, I'll tell you. First of all, the island is pure white. I've never seen anything like it. From what I understand, it's based on mineral deposits. It's kind of a one-of-a-kind place. A lot of bad things have happened here, and a lot of people have died, including the night expedition of 1721. As the story goes, it's believed that they thought they were sailing into a safe harbor, but they wrecked into the rocks. And although they got their stores of coal and food and everything out of the ship, it was very shallow, they were marooned, and they slowly perished here of starvation. Back then, no one ever knew what became of them, but ironically, it was Samuel Hearn who ended up finding them 46 years later. There are still faint outlines of Knight's storehouse, and boy, I really wanted to check that out, but I circled and circled, and there just wasn't any safe approaches, so. Next stop was over at Rankin Inlet. It was a spot I was planning to refuel uh, until I would take my next leg, which was the biggest part of the mission, so really needed to get set here with fuel and provisions and uh, then we'd be on our way to the Barren Lands. So Rankin Inlet, it really started with a mine and uh, that started really kicking into gear in 1957. And they were focused on nickel and copper ores from underground operations. And the mine closed in 62 and things kind of slowed down, but it sounds like it's picking back up because there's a new gold operation in town and that's supposed to be really scaling up as of 2019. So the real challenge up here in the Arctic, if you fly a piston-driven airplane like I had at the time, is getting 100 low lead, they call it, it's aviation fuel gas, and there are just very few places to get it, and the places you get it, uh, that you can get it, it's in drums, it uh, all have, has to be done by hand, and uh, it's very expensive. So everything's topped off, got my uh, provisions all set, everything's good to go, and uh, taking off to the west, northwest, circling to the south. Now uh, was really going to be the biggest, most exciting part of this trip was to uh, fly down into the barren lands. And what I was really after was there was this uh, post, this small settlement of some kind that I discovered a couple of years before when I had floats under the plane of course now I'm on wheels and uh, at the time I could have just landed right next to it on this giant lake. It was called Nanjianalini Lake and uh, didn't have time to stop then and I said I'll come back someday and check this out so today was the day. So I had previously studied, uh, found a place I thought I could land. The only problem is it was about five to six miles north. But I was up for the hike, so I thought I would give it a try. So uh, off I went. So flying along, it was a, it was a clear, smooth day. And it's something else, You've, you're flying along up here, I'll tell you, and you, you look down and nothing but water and rock and tundra. You might see a, a caribou once in a while, but it's, it's just so barren as the name. And it's funny, I'd say to myself, and I'd, I'd do this, I'd look behind me and I'd say, wow, it's, it's 250 miles behind me of nothing. And then I'd look ahead and the same thing and you just, you look out there and you just say, wow, this is, this is amazing. And uh, flying all through uh, and around snow squalls and all kinds of weather, it's what you've got to expect up here. And even if you're instruments, uh, you've got to really, really be careful and know your uh, 
always have an out. Know your limitations and make sure you got a way out. And uh, in this case, I'm on top and I have visibility of the ground. It's it's broken, scattered clouds, so in good shape. So uh, just looking for uh, the descent. So I'm in my final descent and I come across the runway. Runway looks good. And I look and I see these lines, these cuts in the tundra. And immediately you know that's from caribou. And come to find out this is like a pinch point between lakes where the big herds come through. Well, just landed on Nedgelini. Air's pretty calm. A lot of snow squalls around, flew around them. Room. And uh, I might march today looking at five miles that way to uh, where the HBC Hudson Bay, Hudson Bay Company cabins are. Uh, I think that was an operation. So I might go today, I might go tomorrow. Um, Do some exploring, check it out. There are grizzly bears here, black bears. I think we're, t we're a little bit out of range of polar bears. Might get an occasional polar bear here. Probably not. Definitely will carry mace and a rifle wherever I go, which is the first thing I'm going to take out. Watch your back. Cool. Shotgun, Persuader by Mossberg. Got my rifle sling, sling side. I make one out of a belt. Turned out pretty good. Cotter pins. Got it uh, loaded up with first shells a cracker shell and then six slugs and then uh, backup slugs here. Here. Custom made chucks. <clears throat> Here we go. Let's shift this over. There. That should hold. Alright, we've got the charger. I just filled the fuel tank, emptied this 33 gallon in the main tanks. Gel cell battery, now I'm actually going to, gel cell battery is good, but just to keep a charge on it, I'm going to hook up the generator and uh, generator is 100-2000i. We've got um, auxiliary fuel tank, so this thing will burn for like 30 hours on economy. All right, here's what we got. We uh, connected the fuel pump to the gel cell. As you see there, filled up the tanks. Main tanks here. So those are full. Let's see. All right, signing off. We're gonna march for the Hudson Post down uh, six miles south of here tomorrow. It's gonna be a big day, a big long hike through swamps and stuff. So we'll get some video of that and uh, just gear for tonight. It's probably about 4 p.m. right now. 
and uh, all good. All right, we got a white Arctic wolf looking at me. Where there's one, there's more. He is staring right at me. He's all white. See him? See that wolf? He is big. Now he's turned sideways. He's checking me out. I better watch. There he goes. Boy, he's not going anywhere. Let me tell you, he's going to be hanging around here. At least they're easy to see. They're pure white. He went right over this ridge. He's got to be here somewhere. Where he's laying low. Where is he? God, he was big. Yeah, I'm just sitting here laying low. Look at these caribou trails. This is where the caribou come through. There's several trails here. Huge, deep ruts. Where the wolf was. That thing was. That thing was huge. It had a. I've never seen a, a wolf that big. Full white, so easy to see. Went right over that ridge, about 200 yards away. I think he probably made that tree line. Gotta watch this ridge behind me. I'm just gonna lay low here for a while. He's over there somewhere, and there's probably more. He's pretty shy, but I got pretty close. Although I don't think he saw me until I came over the rise, he kind of hung and looked at me, looked at me a little bit. And then uh, slowly went away. Didn't run. Hopefully, I got that on the video. Coming over this ridge here. That's where I was. Came from up there where the tree line is. Wolf was right there. I think. Uh, I think they're in there. Interesting place. Big Shan Esker here. That's the direction I gotta hike tomorrow. Five to six miles. Should be exciting. Sure. Bones, bones everywhere. Dead caribou. I'm sure the wolves have a field day out here. Dinner time. Got the MSR stoves going. We got a little bacon, steak, and we'll have some bread and butter. We got our jet boil. Had some coffee. Wow, doesn't get any better than that. Even salt and pepper. Cool. All right, cozy inside my little ca little cabin here. We got the heater going. Sun's about to set. Just in case. Uh. My down blanket, Binox, meds, bear spray, zinc pad, watch a movie. Well, I had a pretty good night's sleep and got up a little bit of a late start, but uh, made my way uh, on this hike. Boy, this is one of the toughest hikes I've ever been on through marsh and muck and lake beds. And Anyway, come on along. Let's go. All right, setting off. We got a six-mile hike that way. HBC post. Oh, 
caribou trails. Got to keep a heads up. There are grizzly bears in my area here. So I got going on this hike, and man, the winds were just ripping. Here I'm in the lowland following the caribou trail, and uh, much rather be walking out in the open. Um, it was really kind of eerie knowing the Arctic wolves were right there anywhere. And you get in, uh, I, I really just tried to stay away from those enclosed areas. I really also tried to stay away from the lowlands, and whenever I had the chance, I'd cut through lake beds and beaches and things, although I wish there was more of this. I would have loved to walk the shoreline the whole way, but uh, that was impossible. That is a big offering. So it didn't take long before I looked down and I start seeing wolf paw prints and started looking around and uh, my guard was more up. So I just kept slashing along through this mess. Uh, these fields of marsh and muck would go on for anywhere between 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 yards. So the wind, the wind was now howling at about, it had to be about 40 or 50 miles per hour. So I'm sitting by the stream, catching a breath, looking around, and I get up, and sure enough, I look out, and there I see another, now I see a wolf, now it's for sure, it's, that's a, a Arctic wolf. These two wolves were not as white as the one that I saw back at camp the night before. But I got to tell you, they were covering one to two miles in about a minute or two. I couldn't believe it. They were about a quarter mile out, paralleling me, and they were, they were just flying. Uh, probably in the time it took for me to hike this five or six miles, I bet they could have covered it in less than five minutes. Amazing. So what I did is uh, I stopped and I wanted to see, I knew they were following me, so I just wanted to hang out, hunker down, and uh, see if they would, uh, hey, where, where did he go? Where is he? Let's go, let's go find him. Where did he go? So, uh, but they, they're, they're so smart. They probably were looking at me. You know they were just hanging out watching me wondering if I was injured or down, they probably would have waited hours and then they would move in. So smart. They never came in. I sat there about 20 minutes and headed out. Well, almost there. Got about a mile to go. You can see it straight over there. That's about a mile over the water on that hill. Hudson's Bay comes. I believe we'll check it out. I'll just traverse this uh, lake bed area, march all the way around. Should be there in about a half hour, an hour, hopefully. So I was almost there. I was really excited. I could see it now. I had a Across this uh, lake bed of huge boulders and uh, it was like hey when can we sprain our ankle or break our leg so I was playing hopscotch across these things in hip waders I would have loved to have some better ankle support but it worked out a little bit more hiking after that and I was in the home stretch ice areas up or deeper in some areas Ah, I'm bush. That's six over six miles through the worst terrain I've ever hiked. We got I've done a lot of grouse hunting in Wisconsin. There's no nice trails up here, but there it is. That looks like an HBC site to me. Pretty cool. Man, I'm bush. I gotta turn around and walk back. 
if there's uh, some different routes. I don't think so. So this was the most exciting part for me. I couldn't believe it. I was finally here, and I'm I'm walking up. And I'm looking down and I see all these artifacts. There were cans, there were forks, there were, uh, I found an ax head, um, cartridges, all kinds of things. I could see three structures right off. The main uh, house that looked probably the place where the trade goods were kept. And to the right there, I think that was probably the shed where they kept the furs and things and uh, there was another structure maybe a living quarters but uh, in I went something's blocking the door there we go wow look at this so this was obviously the kitchen, and the stove was uh, still here. And uh, there even was a cupcake pan still sitting on the stove. Unbelievable. So I just kind of stood there taking it all in, looking around. The next step in here was the, uh, had to be the dining room. Glass still in the windows. And I looked to my left and I started walking further in and there I could see on the walls remnants of the shelves and I knew this was where the goods were traded. I mean, they had producer goods like guns and hatchets and powder and shot, household goods. You could just see it sitting there like blankets. You could see a stack of blankets sitting there. The HBC, the famous wool point blankets and kettles and the tobacco and other things like buttons and clothes and combs, needles and spoons, who knows what, but uh, you could just see it just sitting there like it was there today. Wow. Upstairs. I don't fall through the floor. Look at that. Hey, the old bed springs. Back. <laughs> Little people. So they made them in the old days. Trust these stairs. We get stuck down here. It would not be fun. All right. Not much here. Look at the old logs. That's that dates back. So what's really fascinating is at a certain point I had done some hiking around the perimeter of these structures and I found remnants of what looked like tent-like structures um, and it appeared to me that the, the native peoples here actually lived right in this area all around this trading post. It must have been like a village. So here I'm walking up to what must have been the place where they stored and traded all the, uh, for all the furs. And uh, you can see here the counter uh, and, and the scale. The scale is still, uh, it's still here, just as it was. 
uh, just, just fascinating. And as I looked around the room, I could see the, uh, it had higher ceilings. You could just imagine the stacks of furs. Typically they would be pressed into 90 pound uh, parcels that the, uh, uh, many of the traders, I don't know if here, but the voyageurs would take, uh, anyway, they would have to bring it back to Fort Churchill, which was uh, quite a ways away from here. Ah, living quarters. Wow, check this out. So this was really interesting. This structure, this one-room cabin, this had to be the house for the HBC manager that was governing this area and his family. And here uh, is the outhouse for that. There's an old outhouse. Look out below. Pretty sturdy stuff. Signing off. We're gonna head back and uh, maybe get back to Churchill tonight. Maybe stay over another night. We got six miles ahead of me. That away. Looks like snow is moving in. If you want to get a feel for how big these woods are, see that track. So after I saw this wolf track, about 10 or 15 minutes later, I saw some fresh tracks and they were right on my foot trail, the way I'd come in. Well, it didn't take long for the snowstorm to come in and envelop me and all I could do was hunker down and uh, I was laying there. I couldn't see five feet in front of me and I'm just looking around. Oh my gosh, I just don't want to see one of those faces coming out of the gloom. So after I hiked to this location and after I explored it, I really started to wonder who was here? What was this? And when I got back, I started to do some research on it. And I was, I was saddened to find out the history of this. I found out that this was the epicenter. This was, this was centrally associated with the death of a nation, a nation of people called the Saezi Dene who inhabited this area for as many as 10,000 years hunting caribou. And they were forcibly removed by the provincial Canadian government in 1957. And they were moved to Churchill. And when they got to Churchill, what were they given? They were put into cardboard huts that were built from pieces from the garbage dump. And there, many of the tribe members froze. They were murdered. They died of starvation. Out of 250 tribal members, only 117 had survived by 1973. And it was in 1973 when the Canadian government moved them back, back to a place called Tadouli Lake, which is ironically straight south of here, straight south of this place where I've been, this land of their ancestors. So in the times that have passed, there's many times that I've wondered as I stood there, if only the walls could talk, I could imagine all the hunts, the good hunts, the winters, the summers, the kids laughing, the traditional ways, and then the sadness.